Hey everybody, welcome to the shop. Um, to be honest with you, I, I've got a repair in here on the Jeep and I didn't even think about throwing the camera up. This would have been a good one for troubleshooting. Um, so let me give you a little bit of preface. Uh, what got us to this point and then I'll bring you in and show you what, <coughs> excuse me, show you what I'm doing. So a couple days before Christmas, wife and I was just running We'd done all our running around and everything and was just on our way to go grab some uh, takeout from one of our local restaurants. Not hot rodding it. Those of you who know me, no, I don't. I drive this thing like a baby carriage. I don't hot rod it. I probably ought to push it a little bit more, to be honest with you, but I drive all my vehicles fairly conservatively. Um, however, we were just sitting at a stoplight, <clears throat> turned onto a, what we call the old highway here. It's a 55 mile an hour, it parallels the interstate. It's a lot quicker to get around to some of the local areas than jumping on and off the interstate. Anyway, so we returned, we got up to speed, Jeep was running good, I mean, just running like normal. We get up to the next stoplight, everything was fine. We get to the next stoplight, and as we pull up to the light, it starts shuddering pretty bad. And it was, it was noticeable I had a, a miss, a dead miss. No check engine light at that time. The wife says, what, what's going on? I says, I don't know, I says, that's kind of weird, she's never done that before. And my first thought was, I just filled up fuel the night before this is the first time we've driven it and we'd only gone maybe five or six miles so probably four, three or four miles after fueling it five or six miles so less than 10 miles on this full tank of fuel and I had half a tank before so I only put a half a tank in it and I'm thinking ah, I can't I can't see it being so unvolatile that it's running that poorly I mean it was a dead miss so the light turned, we started to go a little bit, and it cleaned up, and actually the check engine light went away. And I'm thinking, well, that's weird, it must be a soft code. Um, I just got on the throttle just a little bit, and it seemed to be decent. And then next stoplight, it's it, uh, dead miss again. This time, was, this time the check engine light came on, this time it was way worse, and we couldn't even, it couldn't even get out of its own way. We flipped around, come home, pulled it here in the shop, and I thought, you know what, I'll, uh, I wanted to hurry and pull the codes, but then I thought, I'll mess with it the next day. So I, I told the wife even, I says, that felt like more than one cylinder, that is more than likely gonna be a P0300 code. Pulled it back in the shop, wife went in the house. Um, I went ahead and pulled the, extracted the code out of, codes out of it, and it had a P0300, and then it also had a P1380 and P1381, which I was not familiar with those ones, I gotta be honest. I had to look those ones up. And they were uh, misfire caused by rough road. <laughs> now, <laughs> this Jeep sees a lot of off-roading and a lot of rough road. I have never gotten those codes before. So the fact that I had gotten those two codes on a smooth highway, asphalt highway, I led me to believe that I think the miss come first and the bucking and everything was was what triggered the other two codes. So I kind of dismissed those. I thought, okay, I got to look for a a, uh, a random misfire. So the engine was warm and everything. So we we said bag it. It was it was it wasn't getting late, but it was I didn't want to mess with it that night. Um, being coming up close to Christmas and everything, I wanted to go in the house and relax. So the next day I come out, had a little bit of time, so the next day I come out and I thought I'm just gonna throw the scanner on it, see if I can pick up any one cylinder more than another that's throwing misfires. And I'm not gonna lie, this, this is an L94, so it has GM's AFM, you know, or DO, it's, it, GM calls it AFM, it's active fuel management, but basically it's displacement on demand, it's where it cuts out half the cylinders on low, low and light loads uh, for fuel economy. That has never been turned on in my software. I, I, turned, I deactivated that from day one when I put this vehicle, when I put this L94 in our Jeep, just because it's aerodynamic, it's got the aerodynamics of a phone booth. It's not going to be a low load situation and I didn't want to have to deal with it. I'm, I have not had that great of luck with them, so I just deactivated it right from day one. The hardware is still there. I waffled as I was doing the engine. I waffled on changing it, or going through and deleting everything, all the hardware, but my thinking was, is this is a, I had gotten a production motor crate, and it had a warranty. I wanted to put it in and run it, and if there was any problems, I didn't want to have it, any warranty or anything like that denied because I had been in there deact uh, taking all a bunch of components out. So I thought, that's something I'll do down the road, and actually I still am going to do it. 
but it's never been activated on this vehicle. However, the AFM lifters and the VLOM, uh, the, the uh, valve lifter uh, oil manifold is all still intact. It's just not active, it's just deactivated through the software, the operating system. So my first thought was, oh crap, do I have, uh, did I just lose an, a, a, an AFM lifter? But it, usually those are accompanied by a pretty good tick or a clicking sound as those lifters crunch, it creates slop in that valve train, in that particular valve train. So I thought, well, I'm gonna throw the scanner on it, I'm gonna go into the misfire data, and I'm gonna look, and cylinders one, four, six, or yeah, one, four, six, and seven are the cylinders that are affected by the AFM. It's the front and rear on the driver's side, and the two middle on the passenger side, so it's evenly balanced. So I pulled up the misfire data, and I did have a few at idle for four, but two was a dead miss. Two was counting, counting up and it kept resetting the counter as it was getting to the max. So I knew cylinder two was, was, was a dead hole. Four, I, my first thought was where they share a cylinder wall. I thought, oh crap, did I blow a head gasket? But I'm thinking, God, it was, it was barely at 185 degrees. I've never overheated this thing. It just, nothing was indicating that. And even on the prime, I thought, well, maybe an ignition coil. But even at that, I thought, it's gotta be secondary side because on the primary side, the uh, ECM looks for feedback, um, and if anything comes back suspicious, the ECM will trigger a code for that cylinder. I wasn't getting any of that, so I kind of thought, well, maybe a spark plug or a coil. So I pulled, pulled cylinder two, spark plug out, looked, <coughs> looked good, pulled coil off, kind of bench tested it, didn't seem to jump, nothing jumped out of me. I swapped it with number five, did a little swaptronics there. I swapped it with number five because five I knew wasn't part of the AFM and it was, to be honest with you, it was easy to get to. So I switched those two coils, um, spark plugs, no difference. So then I thought, okay, I'm gonna do a compression check. I hate to go mechanical, but it just wasn't sounding. Even when it was running, it had a weird puffing sound. And I'm thinking that, it, I'm not gonna lie, my gut kept telling me there was something internal, but my mind was trying to talk my gut out of it. So. Did a compression check, zero, P, zero compression on cylinder two. Check number four, just for chits and grins, because it's right there, 175, 177 pounds compression. So I thought, okay, I got a problem in number two. So it was getting close, this was on Christmas Eve. It was getting close where uh, wife and I had plans for uh, with kids on Christmas Eve, so figured, okay, bag it, I know kind of direction. I come out Christmas morning for a little while um, and pop the rocker off and everything. My I kept thinking, did I break a spring? Did I break a spring? If I broke a spring, I hope the valve didn't drop down and thump the piston. And pulled the rocker cover off and everything, and sure enough, I got a broken spring. Um, bone stock engine, I know, you don't see them, t well, you see it occasionally on the, on, the, on the pickups and the trucks and SUVs forums, but for some reason, I, I belong to the Camaro, the fifth gen Camaro forum as well. And there's actually more of them over there, and even on the Corvettes. Um, the C5s and stuff, then you see them on the, in the truck SUVs. But I think it was just a fluke deal. So um, I got the parts ordered. It's after Christmas now. I'm waiting for the parts to show up any day, and then I can put this thing back together. Um, but I'm going to grab the other camera, and I'm going to come in here and kind of show you what I found. And then I'm gonna, I'll prop the camera up while I'm going through and um, pulling uh, rockers and, and whatnot and kind of walk through it. So... Uh, anyway, that's kind of what led, has led us up to this point. Um, it could have been a lot worse. I'm still going to do the AFM down the road. Um, so like I said, this, this, this engine only has 64 and 64,000 and change on it. So I'll probably run it for another year or two and then get all the parts to do the AFM delete and then schedule the repair when I don't have any trips planned so that I can take my time and do it. And then actually I'm going to order two kits because I'm gonna do the, uh, the, the fifth gen Camaro. It's got an L99 in it, and I'm gonna do the same thing to that. But I'm gonna keep the VVT on both engines. I really like the VVT. The VVT system is not really problematic. I like the low end torque, I like the smooth idle. I, I know a lot of people on the, on the Camaro forums are taking the VVT out, putting the LS3 cams and so forth in. I don't really wanna mess with that because it's not a race car, it's a touring car. I uh, want the wife to drive it. I don't want that rumpity rump. Um, I don't want to have to go in and change torque converter, put a looser torque converter, stuff like that in it. Down the road, if grandsons wants to do some racing and stuff like that, if 
gets to that point, yeah, maybe that's something we can, uh, I can build with him. But right now, I just, want a, I just want a nice smooth touring car, but I want to eliminate the worry of that AFM. And I've got it deleted on the Camaro too, but that was, we bought the car with 61,000, and I deleted it right away when I did my Borla exhaust. So I've only put a few thousand miles on it since it's been deactivated. The previous owner was bone stock and ran the AFM. So I don't think any damage has been done. The car runs so good. But again, I'm going to order two kits and do both of them. So let me grab the other camera, and I'll show you where we're at. Bear with me here. I'm trying a new camera mount here. So, okay. As you can see, I've already pulled off the two rockers, the intake and exhaust rockers here for the uh, cylinder number two. And there you can see the broken spring. Um, this valve is quite loose. Luckily, the keeper stayed in the retainer and nothing dropped down into the cylinder. I stuck a boroscope in. It looked like everything's okay. The intake's nice and tight, um, but I've got new springs and intake and exhaust uh, guide seals coming. So we'll go ahead and get this torn apart. Now, when tearing these apart, I know some people, this is, on, uh, this is a, the GLS platform is a net lash system. So the old days of the small block and, block and big block uh, valve adjusting where you run the rod, you run it down until you have zero lash, and then you go three quarters of a turn or whatever on the, on the adjustment. Um, these are a little different. These have a set length push rod, and then you, which, which you have to make sure you get the right length, and you do that if you change cams or anything, but for the most part, they're all um, 7.4 on these LSs from the factory. Um, but when you, when you tighten these down, you just, snu you just run them down and torque them to 22 foot-pounds, and they're a net lash system, so there's no adjustment. Now, taking these apart and putting them back together, I don't like to back them off and I don't like to tighten them down when the valve is being held open, meaning you're up on the, on the lobe of the cam. Cylinder number um, six right here, six exhaust is open, eight intake is partially open, the other ones are kind of loose, so I will run the ones out, back these ones out that are on the base circle of the cam, and then once, and then I'll turn the engine over, probably 180 degrees, I'll do the same on the other side, and then the other ones that come up, I'll go ahead and back them off. And I do the same thing when I assemble them, because I don't like to put all that extra stress and tension on the fastener as it's being pulled down in. I've, I think you could probably damage some threads if you were trying to open that valve and pull everything down with that bolt. I know people have done it very successfully in a lot of them. That's just the way I choose to do them. I choose to roll the engine over, remove and assemble the rockers with, on, the base, on the base circle of the cam for that, for that cylinder. You generally only have to roll the engine over one time. Then what I'll do, once I do that, then I'll go through and I'll run a torque wrench through all of them again just to make sure. But anyway, I'll cover that when I'm going back together. But I'm gonna go ahead and pull these off I've got the spark plugs out because I'm going to go ahead and change spark plugs while I'm at it. I was actually had that on my list of things to do. I was at about 65,000. So I'm within a thousand miles of that. So I'm going to go ahead and put these spark plugs in it when it goes back together. But I've got all the spark plugs out, ignition, coil packs off, rocker covers off. Now I'm just going to go through and pull the rocker arms and uh, be awaiting my new valve springs. With the camera moved in here, um, I'm going to show two different styles of spring compressors for these LSs. Um, one of them is made by Comp Cams. And it is to be used, you can see the bottom of it's radius. It's to be used in conjunction with the uh, uh, Trunnion standoff plate for the rockers, and the other one is made, the one I have here is made by Trick Tools, and it is flat on the bottom, so it is made once you get all the rockers, the uh, rocker stand, everything out of the way, and it bolts flat to the head casting. I've used them both, they both work equally well. Um, I am going to demonstrate both styles. In, uh, to keep the video informative. But I'm going to start off because I already, I'm going to start off with the uh, radius one that mounts into the, the rocker stand. 
because I already have those two rockers removed and I have not removed the rest of the rockers yet. So uh, I, there's, other, there's, there's a string method, which I've heard people mention, where they stuck a, stick a string down in, roll the engine over to top bed center. Basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to hold those valves closed. I have not used that personally. Um, it, it, for, in my opinion, it's, it takes a little more time, but if you don't have an air compressor and you don't have all those other things, it, 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 is, a, it is an option. I've always had air in my shops, so for me, I like to inject air in, and I, I like to do that twofold for, to, for, for two reasons. Number one, it's quick, simple. You can just move from hole to hole to hole. The biggest reason, well, besides having air, is also I like to do a cylinder leakage test at the same time. Now, with this cylinder being questionable, number two, because that's where my valve spring is broken, I really want to make sure that I have good, uh, that I still have good sealing capabilities there. So I grabbed my snap-on leak down cylinder leakage tester and let's get the air hooked up here. I, ar I already have the this end threaded into the spark plug hole. So now that I have the gauge hooked up, this is probably showing up upside down, I will run the air pressure up to around 100, 90 to 100 PSI. I'll probably run it up close to 100 for measuring purposes, it's an easy calculation that way. So there's 100 PSI going into the manifold and to the hose. I then hook that up. Now you can see right here also, that valve, if I push down much on it, I can get play out of it. I don't wanna pop the keeper off, so I'm being very careful, because I don't wanna pop that keeper off and have uh, the valve drop down into the cylinder. I've avoided it this far, so I don't wanna have that happen now. Can't get my hands behind me here to hook that up. Make sure I'm still on. Yep, still on 100 psi there. There we go. Okay, now you can see it's putting air. And that's perfect. I've got less than, well, it's still climbing. I've got w well under 10% of leakage. So I know that cylinder is good. I know that that valve didn't get damaged uh, when, it, uh, when the, oh, uh, valve spring broke. So now I'm gonna go ahead and bolt this tool down to the churning stand. You don't have to crank down on these. I just snug them down so the tool doesn't move around. Okay, now this part. Oops, don't know what exactly I did there. But this part will go down underneath. Oh, also before. Before you get too crazy with um, doing on this, take a small dead blow and smack the retainer. What you're trying to do, that keeper is tapered and it sits up tight against that retainer. And when you're compressing this, you want to make sure when you compress it, you compress the keep the, uh, sorry, the retainer and the spring down away from the keeper. If it's still stuck in there, it'll play hell getting that apart. This, the, the exhaust side I know is already, because I could turn it independently. So we'll go ahead and turn this down. Let's try that again, shall we? There we go. So that keeper. Now the problem with this right here is this side has, has less spring pressure is going to actually compress sooner than the other side. 
Now this is where you want to be careful also. You do not want to drop your keepers. Or you'll be playing hell trying to find them. One keeper. And two keepers, okay. So I got both keepers off of those two valves. So let's go ahead and back this tool off, get the springs out of the way. I also think worth mentioning that when you're using these tools, keep some lube on the threads of the uh, tool. I just, uh, I think the comp cams cut one comes with a little package of lube. I just use a little bit of Molly lube on them. Okay, so there's the intake valve, and there is the broken exhaust valve. All right, so while I'm right here, I'm gonna change the valve guide seals. Uh, probably not necessary, I've only got a little over 64,000 miles on this motor, but I'm right here. I'm, I'm going with the actual OEM GM valve guide seals, so they can tell them that this is uh, part number, the exhaust is a red um, tip, and it's 1248-2062. I'll put a link to these in the description as well as the springs. The intake is black, and it's 1248-2063. So to start with, you need to, to you need to remove the original seals. So there's the exhaust one. And there's the intake. Set them aside. Take just a little bit of assembly lube and probably don't need to because there's already oil and everything on the end of the valve stem. But I'm going to put a little bit of assembly lube so that I slide the new seals down over. Make sure the black is intake. Slide it down over. Should seat right on. Exhaust is red. Slides right down over. And seats right down against the head. Now you want to make sure that seat fully. I just grabbed a 17 millimeter, it slides all the way over it there, and just push it. Um, I would advise against using a hammer. I'm not a big fan of knocking on over the hammer. At this point, go ahead and assemble the new valve springs and retainers, new or re used ones if you, like I'm, I'm reusing mine, so totally, totally fine to reuse the existing. Bolt the tool back down to the head and go ahead and start uh, snugging that down until you can expose the valve stems for the uh, K 
keeper installation. Being cautious you don't hit the valve and push the valve off its seat. Okay. Now this is where I like to take just my little level finger, if you will, a little pocket screwdriver. And I will just put a little bit of grease around the end of the valve stem there. And this just helps to keep the keepers stuck to that valve stem and in place. Not necessary, but yeah, I've found that it does help when you start to backing things away a little bit. And this is where you want to really be careful you don't drop your keepers. Okay, there's the intake. Sometimes those pliers are more of a pain than they're worth, so. Okay, so now we've got the keepers in place. Now we're gonna slowly back the tool off and watch very carefully as you guide the retainers up on that taper and lock. Yep, and they capture. And that one now captured the uh, keepers in the retainer. Go ahead and pull the bridge out. Remove the tool. And cylinder number two is done. So only seven more to go now. And I'm still showing good on my leakage. And there's where my little bit of leak was coming from. Must have backed the thread out just a little bit, so. All right, one cylinder. One cylinder down. Seven more to go. Probably don't need to watch me do the other seven. Um, first of all, I'm going to go ahead and back the rest of these um, rocker arms off. I've got, looks like, looks like number eight. Oh, there's a couple of them that are tight. So I'll go ahead and back them off, roll the engine over, and then grab, grab the last couple as well as on the other side. And then we can uh, move forward with the other ones without the rocker arms in place. Does, having the having all the rocker arms out of the way does give you a little bit more room so I'm not gonna lie it does make it uh, a little more beneficial especially reaching these back ones without having to worry about the valves in front of them in place or in the, in the way all right moving on now I'll demonstrate this tool it's pretty much the same as the other only this one mounts directly to the head 
without the uh, rocker stand or the trinium stand, whatever you'd like to call it. This one bolts directly to the flats machined into the head. So you run the bolts down in. Snug, snug them down. Then you grab the top piece. Actually, before I do that, I'm gonna, before I get ahead of myself, I'm gonna hook up the air. Adjust it up to around 100 PSI. So far, all the cylinders have been uh, between about seven and 10% of leakage, so very well within spec. Run that down on, put the bridge on. I run this down quite a ways, so it's pretty, bolts down in there quite a ways, so you don't have to thread the nut all the way down. Okay, now we go ahead and compress the springs. Keepers, all four keepers out of the way. Back the tool off. down in and grab the seals. You know what? I don't think you got good enough light. You probably can't see what the heck I'm doing here. See if that's any better. Two new seals, a little bit of lube on the valve stem, and make sure the red one goes to the exhaust, and the black one goes to intake. And I'll just grab a 
deep socket. Goes down all the way to the hat. Push it down to the casting. Before I put them on right out of the box, I've, I've already checked them. I've checked them all with the uh, I've already checked all the springs with my Rymac tester. So maybe on the next one, we, when I get to, to get to the next one, I'll bring you over to the bench and show you uh, the tester that I use to, to check my valve springs to make sure they're all within spec. I don't doubt they are. It's just I'm a firm believer of trust but verify. When you get parts like this in, especially lately, parts have been uh, kind of all over the place as far as quality goes lately, the last few years. I've been fortunate and haven't got too many poor quality ones, but it doesn't hurt to double check and plus I've already got the tools and everything to do it so there's really no excuse not to. Okay, go ahead and run the, this tool down the same as the other one. Now one thing, I'll make sure and point this out here. One thing you'll notice is that sometimes the valve stem is not centered in the retainer and that's an easy fix you can just take a screwdriver and just kind of tweak the bridge and it will and you can wiggle that just a little bit to uh, get it to center so your keepers will go all the way down and if you don't do that you'll fight your stems not centered in those retainers you will fight getting the retainers, or the keepers, down in there. That's far enough. Okay. Again, just grab a little bit of grease on my pocket screwdriver, or my 11th fingers, I like to call it. Okay. Go ahead and insert the keeper, and the grease helps it stick in place. Just like so. And I like to get it to where it's comfortable, the comfortable position, and then rotate it around the stem, rather than putting one in where it's comfortable and then fighting the other one around the other side. Put it in where it's comfortable, turn it to where it's on the other side, because you can lock it into that groove when you turn it. Then you stick the other one back in from a comfortable position as well. That way you don't have one comfortable and the other one you gotta stand on your head or hold your tongue just right or plan it to have to be in alignment, whatever. Okay, then back the tool out as you back out. You watch to make sure the taper is feeding properly into the retainer. And I also will watch the top of the valve stem to make sure the keeper doesn't come up past the top of that. If you do, then the keeper missed the groove. And you'll generally notice that before you get up to the top because it won't let you go all the way to the top. <clears throat> so, there, go ahead and pull the tool off. Back the air off. 
And there's another one done. So I will uh, move this tool over to the next one. And then uh, before I put the rest of the last couple of valve springs in, I will take you over to the bench and show you my tester and show you how it works. Okay, so here's my uh, valve spring tester. So um, on the side here, you've got a scale and the uh, gauge. I like to do twofold. I, I mean, you can, the scale is pretty accurate on the, uh, the vernier scale on the side, but I will usually set up a dial caliper and lock it down. This is supposed to be 1.8 um, installed height. And then I'll go ahead and compress it down to that 1.8. gauge so you can see it there and you can see it 1.8 I'm barely making contact there and I'm about 94 pounds these have an advertised spec of 92 I believe it is so and it's not uncommon for a new spring to be off one to two pounds um, they will take a seat once they get in and get running but it's not uncommon matter of fact it's quite common for them to be a pound or two high uh, when testing. But anyway, that's how these are tested. I think most automotive machine shops have this style of tester. It's kind of the industry standard. I've had this one for uh, probably 30 years now. So uh, it's done a lot of um, valve springs as well as back when we were drag racing and hill climbing snowmobiles. I used it for primary and secondary clutches to calculate um, Various installed heights for uh, launch, high RPM, weights, to, so I know which weights to accompany it. Uh, to calculate spring rates so I could tailor it towards a specific guy's machine, how he built the motor, um, his rider weight, his riding style, so forth. So I put just as much, I use this tester just as much for, for when we was uh, heavy and deep into snowmobiles as, as quarter mile or, or street or strip. So this tester has been used quite a bit. It's a, it, they're expensive. Maybe now, back when I bought this in the um, mid nineties, they were uh, quite pricey and a hell of an investment. Now you might be able to find them at a yard, yard sale, state sale, something like that for a little bit cheaper. Um, but they're, they're very well, very well, well worthwhile tool. So with showing the springs being tested earlier, I thought it uh, would be wise because there are, hopefully are some astute viewers to my channel that would realize that before you can test your springs, you actually have to calibrate the machine. So for that, you need a calibration spring. And these are available from a multitude of vendors. I think Comp Cams, Crower, I, I believe probably most of your cam um, manufacturers make a calibration spring and with that you will get two specs you will get a um, for for the for the height and the pressure so let's just and I did calibrate this before I checked my other my other spring so the first one is 1750 1.750 so one and three quarter and on these this the rule is actually very very accurate so I'm gonna go down to the rule to 1750 which is right there and it shows 57 pounds so that's off just a little bit but let's double check with the caliper so yeah I'm about yeah I'm 50 uh, between 56 and 58 so 57 right there so now let's go to one three eighths, one point three seven five, and double check it as well. Fifty 
and it should be 164, and I'm just under 166. So one, yeah. So it's pretty, cool, pretty damn spot on. So make sure you get you pick up a calibration spring, and to calibrate this, there is a little lever down in the bottom here where you can change the scale. So that's how you calibrate these. I, I figured it would be worth. I thought about this after I uh, showed the valve springs because I figured someone would call me out that I needed to calibrate this. So I just thought I'd show how to calibrate it real quick. Okay, as we go back through, I went through and pressure check, or uh, excuse me, leakage tested all the cylinders again. And all of them have less than 10%, most of them around 7, 8%. So phenomenal considering this engine's got 64, just over 64,000 miles on it now. So. Also, I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, but once I get the springs all in, I will take a mallet, hammer, whichever you can, and go through and smack the top of the valve spring. Just to make sure that keeper is seated all the way into, or the, yeah, the, Keep it seated all the way into the retainers. So at that point, um, I will push the push rods. Actually, I've got two push rods here that are not in the engine yet. So let's take care of that. So I'll go ahead and install the push rods. And you want to make sure it goes down into properly into the receptacle. There are a little pocket there in the uh, lifter, kind of hard to miss them on, on these, I think. Okay. Now you can kind of tell just by looking at the push rods here, which ones are on the base circle of the camshaft. Um, it'll be it'll be more obvious once you get the rockers on, but I'll go through and start from the rear and work my way forward, putting the rocker arms on. And at that point, um, you'll be able to see those that are higher than the surface mount for the uh, cut rocker cover are up on the lobe of the camshaft they're trying to push the valve open so those ones i will just run down to finger tight well actually i'll run them all down finger tight but i'll run those down finger tight and then i'll come back through and those that are sitting lower which the rocker arm will show is either at or just below this mounting surface those are the ones i will go ahead and tighten down and torque to 22 um, foot pounds then i'll roll the engine over one time and I'll come back and do the other ones. And at that point, it's, uh, then I'll, I'll rather, usually just run through the torque wrench and double check them all, front to rear, rear to front, whichever in order. At that point, we're ready to button up with uh, rocker covers. So um, before I get to that point, I'm gonna go through and put a little bit of lube on each of the top of the rockers, or excuse me, push rods. as well as the valve stems. Just for assembly and for a first startup. And then starting at the rear, we'll go ahead and set a rocker down onto the stand. Make sure it engages with the push rod. Take a socket, and you can just thread them down by hand. Push rod. 
you there in on the valve stem. Okay, with all the rocker arms on and just brought down to zero lash, uh, this part probably isn't necessary, but I like to do it just because it makes sure that all of the trunnions for the rockers are sitting parallel in that, in that stand. Um, if you notice each one of the rockers here, and my paint pan, each one of the rockers here have got a squared edge across the top. So I just like to take a straight edge, lay it down and eyeball across those and make sure they are all even all the way across those rockers. That way you know that the trunnion is sitting down perfectly parallel, perfectly seated down in that uh, radius. And then also you make sure that all your rocker or your tips for the valves are centered over the valve stems. The, these have, a, some of them are straight, some of them are offset. So you wanna make sure you have them all um, in the correct orientation. And that, uh, using a straight edge like that kind of just helps, kind of helps put a visual on it, make sure that all your rockers are uh, properly seated and, and sitting down on those, uh, on that stand. Now, at that point, you can see this cylinder number two exhaust is actually, the rocker is slightly above this mounting surface. So that one is on the, coming up, it's either on the top of the lobe or coming up on the lobe. The intake is below that so surface. So what I will do now is I'll go through and all the ones that are sitting down on the base circle, I will tighten them down. Now I like to do this just because I make, you, you don't have to do this, you can go right to torquing them to 22 foot pounds. But I like to do this step because it lets me know that all of the lifters are collapsing the same amount, as well as it makes sure that you're engaged in that lifter properly. You usually want to see between three quarters and uh, I believe one and a half turns from zero lash. What I've been finding on most of the ones I've done is they're right around one to one and a quarter. So, okay, now quarter, half, three quarter, one, one turn. So now that one can come back, I can torque it. The, let's see, the next one is the same. Next one looks like about the same. These are all been right up one. That one there can go, yep. One. And next one. One. And let's do eight uh, intake. One. Okay, so now that I've got all those snugged down, I'm going to come in with a torque wrench. I'm going to torque those particular ones to 22 foot-pounds. Okay. Now, any of you that watch my uh, overhead that I run on my Cummins ISL know that when I get through just in one, I like to go in and put a paint pan marking on the top, knowing that one's done. Then go to the next one. Okay, and mark it. And then just progress through them. Dag nabbit. Gonna have a hard time pulling on my paint pan today. Now I can't remember which one that was, so I better, yeah, I better double check. I think it was that one, so I don't want to make a mistake and not uh, torque them, 
torque one. All right, at this point, we'll go ahead and roll the engine over. I've already got a ratchet down onto the crankshaft bolt. Should roll over pretty easily because I don't have any spark plugs installed yet. So I will uh, pick a point on the guess. Yes, I'm gonna mark a point on the Bouncer. Okay. Got a point marked. Let's go ahead. Don't have a lot of room here with the upper radiator hose, but a fine tooth ratchet, so it's rolling over pretty quickly. And watching the valves. All the ones that were marked should be, oops, should be starting to open. And there we are. Okay, pull my ratchet out. Now we can go through and those ones that I did not do, that now they are sitting below the surface and actually on the base circle. One turn exactly on that one. All right, spark plugs are installed and torqued to 11 foot-pounds. I've run through the uh, torque on the, <coughs> excuse me, on the rocker arms. I've got the valve covers cleaned, new gaskets installed on them. Now when you go to set these on, you want to be very careful you don't roll that gasket. So set it in place with one hand and start a fastener with the other. And you want to kind of watch sliding it around. If you have to move it, kind of pick it up away from the ceiling surface because ideally you should not have any oil or anything on your ceiling surface, which I ran around it with some brake wash on a shop towel, paper towel, just before putting the valve cover on. But if you have to move it, you don't want to kind of, you don't want to twist it because you can roll that gasket that's in that groove. So now that everything's there in place, I am going to take my mirror and just run it around the full perimeter and make certain that I see the even amount of gasket material and that nothing looks like it's rolled. See good on top here. The I can see on top here. Looks good. It's good here on the end. Okay. So I've just got a small eight millimeter here, and I'm going to kind of just center this 
for the bolts, and the bolts have new grommets on them as well. These get torqued to 106 inch pounds. So, run that down to snug. Run this one, and they are tapered, so they should self center, but you want to. You want to kind of make sure you're pretty close, so you don't have, like I say, you don't have to move that rocker and run the run the gamble of rolling that gasket. See the gasket somewhat compressing. I like to start from the middle and work my way out, just like you would on a cylinder head. So I'm just snugging them down, taking up the play. Okay, now I'll grab my torque wrench, set up to 106 inch pounds. With, with all the ignition coils reinstalled in place. Um, I had I had some wire loom here that I didn't like the looks of. It was all crumbling, so I went ahead and cut it all off. And uh, while I was right here, and replaced it with new uh, nylon uh, split loom. So with all that done, yeah, I got the coil packs reconnected on both sides. Um, I was putting the spark plug wires on. I thought I'd show something that I think is a bit of a misconception. So I've seen people in the past when they're putting dielectric grease on their spark plug boots that they smear it around the end here. Um, that really doesn't do much. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get it up inside so it creates a barrier to the porcelain and so and, and, and also ease in releasing down the road. So I just like to take a little bit. You don't need a ton. You don't need to slather it in it. Just take a little bit on the end of a screwdriver and I stick it up inside a good Oh hell, I don't know, whatever, quarter of an inch or so, run it around, wipe it off the end, then go ahead and put your heat shield on. And now, when I put the spark plug, uh, that end on the spark plug, right as soon as I put it on, I give it a little bit of a rotation to make sure and evenly distribute that. And then I kind of find the natural lay of the wire Okay, I don't know if you heard that or not, but it snapped onto the spark plug. And like I say, then I kind of find the natural lay of how the wire goes and orientate the boot accordingly. And connect. to the coil, just like that. Okay, so there, all the spark plug, spark plugs are installed, spark plugs, everything. Uh, spark plugs were torqued to 11 foot-pounds, which is the factory spec. And now we are ready to go ahead and connect the battery. And Fire the little girl up. So I'm gonna go ahead and move the uh, camera out of the way. All right, towel's removed. Everything I get rid of the engine bay good once over. Make sure it's out of the way.
All right, well, I appreciate you coming along for the repair and uh, hope you found it informative. And if you like it, appreciate the thumbs up and I welcome the comments. Thank you.